Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jen Leonard, Executive Director of the Future of the Profession Initiative at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. Welcome to Reimagining the Future of Legal Technology, the final in our three session virtual summer event series on reimagining the future of the legal profession. If you missed either of our earlier events on reimagining law firms or reimagining legal operations and would like to watch the recordings, or if you'd like more information about our experts, please visit futureoftheLegalProfession.org for more detail. The global pandemic has accelerated so many of the trends that were already unfolding across our profession, and this rapid change is certainly true in the world of legal tech. Our expert guests today will educate us about the expansion of legal technology over the last decade, the ways the pandemic has accelerated both the proliferation and adoption of new technology, how the role of lawyers across systems might change, how legal tech should integrate with consumer legal services and court systems, and how law schools should be responding to ensure lawyers of the future are well prepared to navigate these challenges and emerge as leaders. But first, a few housekeeping items. To submit a question, please use the Q&A feature found on the ribbon at the bottom of the window. The Q&A portion will be facilitated by one of our innovative rising 2L students, Sonari Chidi. Please upvote any questions you'd like the guest experts to answer. Please keep your questions topical and appropriate. Anyone posting inappropriate language or content will be removed. We are recording this webinar. If you're seeking CLE credit for today's event, please note that CLE codes will be presented twice per hour. Therefore, there will be three CLE codes today. Write down these codes and enter them on your digital evaluation form once the event is over. The evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credit. Please find the link to the evaluation form in the chat. These codes will tell us how long you attended. The first pass code is PURPLE, P-U-R, PLE. And with that, I'll turn it over to our co-moderators and legal innovation experts to guide our conversation. Joe Borstein is a double Penn grad, having graduated from Penn undergrad and Penn Carey Law School. He's worked in big law and has spent the last decade with Pangea 3 as it moved from startup to acquisition by Thomson Reuters and EY Legal Services. He also writes about legal innovation and technology for Above the Law. He's an investor and advisor to legal tech startups and is preparing the launch of his own new legal innovation venture later this fall. More details soon. Our other co-moderator is Priya Lele. Priya is a lawyer, entrepreneur, and legal operations lead with Herbert Smith Freehills, and she's based in the UK. Priya uses legal process design and human-centered innovation to develop new ways of working and user-centric solutions to help future-proof our profession. A dedicated champion for diversity and inclusion, she's the co-founder of my new favorite discovery, She Breaks the Law, a community of women innovators and entrepreneurs in the legal profession. Joe and Priya are prepared to navigate an excellent conversation with our guest experts today. And with that, I'll turn it over to both of them. Thanks, Joe and Priya. Thank you so much, Jane. It's an absolute honor and a pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody from across the pond. Uh, and a very warm welcome, particularly to our uh, distinguished panelists. And if I could ask, um, starting from the Honourable Justice um, McCormick, to please introduce yourself briefly, um, your background um, and interest in the subject, Justice McCormick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for including me in this conversation. I um, uh, hope I bring something important to it. I am the Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court. And like many state Supreme Courts, um, my court is administratively, constitutionally charged with administering all the courts of the state. Michigan has approximately 242 trial courts that hear almost 4 million cases a year. Like um, every other state, uh, 8 out of 10 people in the state with civil legal problems cannot afford lawyers. Um, managing that even before a pandemic was complicated. Um, and then during a pandemic, when all of those courts had to quickly be able to transition to um, working remotely and um, doing so transparently, uh, we've seen it as a tremendous opportunity to rethink what we do from the ground up. And I am primarily interested in the ways in which legal tech can um, uh, enhance and grow access to justice, um, which I believe to be the foundation of the rule of law. Um, it, my concern sometimes is whether we're on a different track than private um, legal tech ventures, but I hope not. And um, I think that's why I'm here. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you very much. That's fascinating. I can't wait to ask you more questions. Um, Jason, if I could ask you to go next, please. Hi, I'm Jason Barnwell. I work for Microsoft and the company that I serve has a growing dynamic business that has to operate in an increasingly uncertain uh, and volatile wor world. And so my role at Microsoft is to help our legal department figure out what the future of our practice of law is gonna look like. And so my background, I, I used to be a software engineer uh, and then I was a startup lawyer uh, and then I came to Microsoft about a decade ago. And I've had experience uh, uh, doing product work, uh, leading uh, IP practice groups, things like that. And so now my work is very much focused on thinking about how we're going to refashion and reshape how we do our work, including with our partners, so that we can be as adaptable and as agile as possible so that we can get the work done that we need to to serve the mission. Thank you. What a diverse and interesting background. Um, David, if, is David online? David, could I ask you to go next, please? Of course. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm David Cunningham. I work for the law firm Winston & Strawn. I'm the uh, chief information officer of the firm, and, and uh, I wear a few hats. So obviously for the firm, I am uh, the complement to Jason's role, always looking at how do we change, how do we support the business of law and the practice of law. Uh, but I've had the, the great luxury of spending a lot of time with uh, not only our clients, but the legal operations leaders of the community. So I'm usually kind of in their shoes thinking about how should the market be better and use words like supply chain and maturity and, and all the ways that uh, the legal market is still uh, years behind other industries. Um, and then um, also have a very kind of data-driven perspective of everything from diversity to value. So work a lot with people dealing with diversity and pricing issues. And, and so I'm a, a shepherd of, of Winston's technology, but also over looking over the market saying, how do we, how do we move ourselves forward? So we all benefit. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Gary, could you please introduce yourself? Hi everyone. My name is Gary Sanga. I am a serial legal tech entrepreneur. So I'm a lawyer by training. I worked at Sherman and Sterling and Whiting Case initially. And then I started a legal tech company during the Great Recession called Intelligize, which helped with SEC filings. Uh, sole founder, uh, really successful outcome that was, acqu was acquired by LexisNexis in one of the largest legal tech acquisitions of the last decade. I sin since started a second legal tech startup called LexCheck where we're applying AI to automatically negotiate and mark up incoming contracts. Uh, so yeah, I love legal tech and just developing solutions to help lawyers out. Thank you very much. Again, what a distinguished panel and um, really a pleasure to have you here. As much as I'd love to dive straight into questions, I have to hand it over to Joe, my um, co-moderator today, who's going to um, briefly give his views about the universe of legal technology, particularly for the benefit of some of our audience who may not be entirely familiar with the world of legal technology, um, and hopefully help us uh, to set the scene for the discussion. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, Priya. And I, I promise I won't monologue for too long, but I hope to get the audience at least a little bit um, excited about uh, what we're going to talk about for the next hour. Um, I think uh, a fair question for everyone to ask themselves uh, if they're in law school, if they're, if they're uh, a young lawyer, or even experienced lawyer, why should I care about this legal tech revolution? Um, and I, I'll give you a few reasons. If you're going to practice law for the rest of your life, you want to be the best lawyer you can be. Um, tech and innovation will allow you to stay at the cutting edge, um, to, to push the boundaries of what you can do, and, and to increase the scale of the type of work. Um, if you're not in love with the practice of law, but you love solving legal problems, um, being a legal tech entrepreneur or part of a company like, like the numerous ones Gary has started could be an amazing career track for you. Um, there's you know, this exciting world of Silicon Valley uh, with, with venture capital and private equity, um, new technology um, and exits. And, and for the first time ever, that is taking place in the legal world right now. Um, in fact, a lot of, of the graduates of Penn Law School uh, have been leaders in that, in that community, including Gary. Um, and finally, um, if, if you, you, know, you have uh, more of a bent towards 
uh, public interest or towards serving the greater good, um, I, I think you have to have an eye on technology, whether it's to make your firm uh, better at the practice of law, to make your company uh, able to serve its ever-growing client base better, or to help your government and your citizens um, solve these problems at scale that we know just aren't being solved by one-to-one uh, -one representation. Uh, and that is not to say there's not a place for that. That is absolutely paramount. All technology can do is add power to legal knowledge that's already there, that's being taught by great law schools and practiced by great lawyers. Um, one thing Jason Barnwell and I have, have, have talked about a lot is um, tech and innovation does not have to be, you know, patent pending. It does not have to, to reinvent everything. A lot of this stuff is using, um, you, you know, existing tools like Microsoft tools, using, um, uh, things that can be found in tech transfer offices of almost every major university. A funny anecdote I'd like to say is that the, um, the uh, wheel was invented 6,000 years before it was put on luggage. Um, that doesn't seem like a very big innovation. If you're too young to have ever lugged a 60 pound bag around an airport, let me give you a preview. It's freaking terrible. Um, and sometimes it's just putting together things that are already there, that are already ready uh, to, to, to really improve the lives, you know, across the globe. Um, so let's just dive in for one more minute. What are we talking about when we talk about legal tech? We're talking about obviously things like AI. We're talking about things like natural language processing, which we'll get into. We're talking about expert systems, which are essentially just complex decision trees. And when you go through the elements of a tort, um, you, you are in fact going in your mind through a complex decision tree. A lot of that can be coded and a lot of that, a lot of these problems, which, you know, any legal issue is, is a legal problem can be solved at scale and in perpetuity through the right combination of, of technology and, and human systems. This is being applied to litigation. I think we all know that, uh, there's things like predictive coding. There's, uh, AI obviously being used by companies like Thomson Reuters. Uh, but also by companies like Case Text, who are, you know, uh, basically reinventing um, research by using computers to go through, you know, the entire corpus of, 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 of common law and finding the connections between them. You also see it in contracting. Everything from uh, large systems that, that hold all the contracts, but also AI that actually helps you redline an, a, a, an opposing party's contract um, using your templates uh, simply via computer technology. Finally, you see it in timekeeping, you see it in brief writing. It's, it's a really exciting time. Um, the last point I'll make is there, there are two ways to look at this incoming wave of technology and there's no question that it is a wave. You can see it in terms of fear um, in that it will and it will inevitably displace and change the environment. That is a fact, the environment is gonna change. But I think a better way to look at it uh, is opportunity. Um, you, you have an opportunity to, to enter as, as a experienced legal professional. You have an opportunity to enter at the ground floors, uh, an industry that is going to make positive change, um, whether we like it or not, uh, from, the, from the ground floor. Um, you have the ability to solve legal problems at scale, uh, like we already talked about. And I think you have the, you have the uh, opportunity to expand demand and actually create a bigger pie. So I think we all know that a lot of people are underserved uh, both rich and poor um, by, the, by uh, the legal economy as it exists. It is too expensive, cumbersome, and time consuming to get things done. And all these little innovations we're gonna talk about can come together um, and make it a, a better environment for, virtual, for the buyers, for the sellers, for the practitioners. Um, and uh, with that, let, let's jump into it. Uh, Priya, can I hand it back to you? Thank you, Joe. That was fascinating. I love the analogy of wheels in the bag in relation to existing technology and, and, and innovation. I'm going to use that. So thank you for that, Joe. And uh, with that, I wonder... Unfortunately, but yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, I wonder whether I could start with you, um, Justice McCormick, um, both from the perspective of being mindful of your time and appreciate that you need to leave us at the top of the hour due to prior commitments. So we appreciate your time for being here and you want to make the most of it. And also selfishly, because as you can appreciate, most of us have private um, backgrounds um, and what we would love to hear your views on uh, the public sector and the legal technology in that sector. So I wonder if I could ask you to please share your thoughts and, and, and shed some light on what you see as some of the potential problems, but also opportunities that legal technology can create in the access to justice and court space. 
Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I, I, I will tell you, I see um, mostly opportunity. I have a few uh, warning signs that I will, I will um, mention, but I see mostly opportunity. I, um, the, the, the only currency we have in courtrooms is public confidence. Um, and public confidence is um, shaky when um, the great majority of people who have to use our courtrooms have to manage it on their own and they're not uh, set out uh, to be user friendly to people who have to manage them without lawyers. Um, but as I said, in Michigan and many states um, in the United States, we're not, we're not an outlier. Uh, most people cannot afford lawyers to, when, when they have to navigate civil legal problems. Um, so if you are being evicted or you have a consumer debt problem or a family law problem, these are pretty um, significant issues in people's lives they have to be added to courts on their own, which might mean they just don't try. Um, there is a significant number of people who don't even um, try and access um, what justice might be available for them. And then a, a, another group that does and, and comes away frustrated. And, and I, um, uh, before we had a pandemic that exposed um, so many of the um, inadequacies, in our, inadequacies in our system, um, we had an access to justice crisis. We did, we were not enough. Um, uh, there are very few industries where you could um, look at the way something is done today and it would look exactly the same way it did during the last pandemic. But courtrooms are one of those. You can walk into a courtroom today and it looks a lot like it did a um, uh, hundred years ago. And um, that's stunning. And, um, um, and, and, and in addition to being stunning, um, is, uh, says a lot. Um, I think the good news for those of you in the um, exclusively private sector of law is the market will eventually um, push, um, push for uh, uh, changes. Um, that's a little bit harder in, in, in government, right? Um, we have to deal with state budgets. Their um, state budgets are, are uh, not usually flush with money for, for courts. Um, and so we don't have the same market forces working in our courtrooms. Um, I, but, but, but even so, we have seen innovations that have um, been really good solutions for access to justice issues. And they've usually been court specific, case specific, jurisdiction specific, but not scaled. You haven't seen them scaled. So things like online dispute resolution, um, self-help legal tools um, have been available in some places. Um, and have usually been successful, but they've been sort of add-ons or ad hoc um, experiments. This pandemic has forced us to um, look at everything from the ground up. Uh, we all had to both, both about how we do our work and what it is we do. So in Michigan, like many other states, on a dime, we had to turn from adjudicating 4 million cases a year in courts all across the state um, in courtrooms to doing them on remote platforms almost exclusively. Very few cases are being heard, heard in courtrooms even today. Um, we had a bit of an advantage in Michigan. We had already purchased Zoom licenses for all of the trial judges of the state. We did that be not because we saw a pandemic coming. I wish I could take credit for that. We did not. We just thought there was some efficiency in um, a big state like Michigan moving to explore some remote platforms. So we were set up with the tools um, to make this transition. We also had a fantastic self-help legal website, which of course is scalable to infinity, right? It, and, and thank goodness it is scalable to infinity because the number of people accessing it through this pandemic, especially for unemployment information, has been off the charts. Um, we quickly ramped up an online dispute resolution pro um, uh, uh, program that was available in 17 of our 83 counties and made it available in 83 of 83 counties. It's free and available to everybody. You can use it with a mediator or without. We are seeing already in four months more change in our state court system than we've seen in two decades. And the changes have been overwhelmingly positive for this access to justice problem that keeps me up at night. Um, the thing that worries me the most is being on two tracks. The track that you all are on, which excites me, and I, you know, I, there's, a, there's a part of me that wants to go work for all of you. Um, but, but, but I, but at the same time, there are all of these folks who need to use our courtrooms and be able to rely on our justice system for fair outcomes and fair process um, who need this revolution um, just as desperately. So I have lots more thoughts, but there's so many other people on, 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 this, on this webinar that I'll, I'll stop there and um, I'm sure I'll have other opportunities for contributing.
thank you very much. That was so fascinating. I mean, you already sort of touched upon some of the things that I would have liked to ask you in the sense of how the pandemic has impacted. And it's really wonderful to hear how um, resilient the system has been and how it has adapted overnight, frankly. And, you know, the, the, the sort of how you've already been sort of thinking a, a, about efficiencies and getting some tools in place that helps you actually to, to adapt to this um, sort of overnight situation. I wonder whether I could ask you one more follow up question and then I can open up. Um, since you've already started touching upon that, particularly the, the point that we are all sort of um, fascinated to hear about, you know, how could we possibly encourage and what in, how could we incentivize, let's say, private and public uh, partnerships in this space so that we can, as you said, do something about this A to J uh, issue that keeps you awake? I, I you know, my, my, uh, it appears we got a freeze. I know. Um, shall we give it another minute? You get, well, maybe we should move to the next question and we'll come back uh, if she... Why, why don't I ask uh, Jason to um, address that question in the meantime, if that's all right? Just if you have any views about how we could possibly uh, incentivize um, private public um, sector um, partnerships in this space. Well, I, I think we've already gotten a fa fabulous incentive, which is we don't really have a choice, right? <laughs> so we... <laughs> Basically, the constraints of, of getting things done are, are forcing us to find new and different ways to work together. And so then it turns into this interesting question of what are the impediments to, to seeing that go faster and how do we make it better? I think the Chief Justice uh, may be back if, if she wanted to finish out uh, uh, her, her, her thoughts. Yes. Um, can you hear us, Justice McCormick? Yeah, sorry, public sector computers. I swear to God, I'm <laughs> unbelievable. Sorry, I lost you there for a minute, but please go on. No, yeah, second time that's happened to me today. I, I, one of these days, you know, the state budget's going to allow for me to get a computer upgrade, but it's not going to be this year, I'm told. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the, I have great hope for public-private partnership in this area, um, in large part because I believe that um, those of you who practice in the private sector and big law has every interest in um, enhancing this currency, right? The, the rule of law depends on um, the, the consent of the governed and um, we're losing the consent of the governed when we can't deliver for the great majority of people who have to use our justice system. And so I, 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 I believe there is tremendous opportunity for, for public par private partnerships. It's gonna take leadership in the public sector, right? You're going to have to find um, uh, chief justices, law, you, know, um, you know, public law school deans and people who want to um, figure this out. Um, but there are, they're out there. And, um, and I feel like now is the moment. I feel like we are at this like once in my lifetime opportunity to really think in big ways about um, rebuilding what we do from the ground up. And I am Call me if you're interested. I am very, very, very interested in this topic. Thank yeah. you very much. And what a lovely shout out um, and call to action that is. Um, and as Jason was already saying, you know, there is uh, enough incentive, incentive given the pandemic, the need of the hour. So uh, hope that uh, that some people um, uh, following this would take you up on that, uh, and we would see some some changes and some some strong partnerships. Um, changing gear slightly, if I could hand back to Joe um, for the next line of uh, questioning. Uh, absolutely, and I think uh, th there were some great points made there that are, that, that are really relevant. Um, there are incentive problems, um, uh, certainly in the public sector, but, but I think what many of us have encountered is there's a lot of incentive problems in the private sector as well. There's a lot of uh, traditional ways uh, the law was practiced, uh, so, some for better, some for worse, that, that, that make it um, difficult to bring innovation uh, and, and certainly uh, faster cycles, especially in the law firm world where the billable hour still reigns supreme. Um, I think this is a really good opportunity to talk uh, to Gary and David. Um, let's start with Gary here. Uh, I, I wanna talk a little bit about what is special about building a piece of legal tech? Um, and um, what, what is it like to, to take a legal problem and try to solve it at scale? Uh, sure. A little two part question, but uh, I think you can handle it, Gary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. What's unique about legal is first off, it's a really big market, right? Well, you know, it's a huge market, but legal is typically a uh, laggard when it comes to technology adoption. So what's unique about it is compared to other large sectors of the economy, 
um, legal has been relatively slow to adopt new tech. And it's a different, that's a different uh, uh, Zoom session to explain why the, the incentives are where they are. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole conversation. <laughs> yeah, but that's good, right, folks? Because literally what that means is you can literally look at other sectors and you can apply their breakthroughs at legal. Uh, I'll give you a simple example. You can pretty much look at any productivity software that the sales organization uses, that the product development folks use, and I bet you a nickel you can use that as inspiration or just tweak it and apply it to legal, right? I bet you a nickel that you can literally look at any incumbent legal research solution that's leading right now, and I bet you a nickel that people in the market find it too clunky or too expensive, right? So there's lots of innovation here. This is not leading, bleeding, cutting tech, uh, cutting edge tech, right? Um, so that's the first thing that provides a lot of opportunities. The challenge with legal tech is, and this is on the entrepreneurs, this is on, on my people, way too many legal tech entrepreneurs think that if they just build the product, the customers will come. And it's, I think this is very unique to legal compared to other sectors, right? Uh, people forget you're trying to build a business, right? And in my view, legal tech is won and lost on the sales and marketing front. And far too many legal tech entrepreneurs figure this out, but it's too late. That's what makes legal tech unique in my view. And, and before we move to David, what does it take? You said sales and marketing is very important. Obviously, that's that's something close to my heart. Go to market's been a big part of, of what I've done my entire career. Um, what, what do you think it takes to bring these ideas into legal and get people to, to change their ways? There's there's value in precedent, right? Precedent, yep, not yep. just in the law, but precedent in the way we do business. Um, so you're asking people in some ways to, to break precedent and try something new. What do you think that what do you think that takes? Absolutely. Um, sessions like this, right? So if you look at typical startups now, you know, software as a service, whatnot, there are best practices now from like your initial idea right to exit, right? And people can teach you how to build a wonderful business. I think in legal, uh, there wasn't that, you know, that playbook of how to build a solid business, right? And far too many folks never appreciated how hard it is to sell. And, you know, how do you think through it from an empathetic standpoint? How do you think through a, you know, the typical consumer is looking for what's their decision making process what's stopping it and you know now that we discuss these topics think about business models think about go to market hopefully people can plan for it so i think things like this are really really useful because they didn't have didn't exist when i started in legal tech thanks gary D david kind of same question could, could we hand it to you from the from the perspective of, of a law firm uh, absolutely and and i i'm fortunate that i I can offer the perspective of the law firm. I'm, I'm part of the Access to Justice program within Texas. <clears throat> and as I said, I, I talk to the legal operations of legal departments a lot. So I, I, any, any time I'm able to kind of weigh those, those perspectives is, is really helpful to each. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a challenge. I would say if you were to separate things and the business of law versus the practice of law, which is an, an imperfect separation. Then on the, on the business side, right, I spend more of my time. In some ways, we're trying to use less legal tech. Um, for exactly Gary's point is that the, the, tech out, the tech that is not specific to this market is often 10, 15 years ahead, or it's just easier to use. And so in a lot of cases, we're trying to run our business, our professional services business, without um, being held back by people that are just focused on legal um, in, in some sense. So it's not a very nice statement, but it, it is a maturity to say that we are, um, when we're looking at how do we you know, have an audiovisual experience for our clients, um, you know, there's no tool in there you'd use that's specific to the legal market. And, sure. and a, as we mature, less of what we're doing as a business is specific to our niche of a niche um, in that sense. Now, I would say professional services is a, you know, much bigger market and there's some things uh, specific to that. So I, I think that is, um, I, I think that's really helping us that we're, we're getting out, we're getting more choices because when we're looking at project management tools or analytics tools, they're not market specific tools. And therefore we can, we can chop around and get the best of the, of the world instead of 
whoever decides, you know, wh whatever lawyer decided to create a tool for this market. Um, on the uh, on the practice of law, you know, obviously that is much, you know, it's very specific even to the type of practice, and so that that's a very different uh, world. But the opportunities there are also, you know, getting better and better. The products um, are very are mature in in most cases, and um, and it is really about how you apply them. It, it's not it, it's not about you know picking the the bleeding edge technology. It, it's really about saying hey, you probably already have the right technology. How are you actually using it to benefit your client? Or, uh, you know, you've got the, the classic adoption problem, right? You have a, have a tool, but 10% of the lawyers uh, use it well. And, um, and, and so when we get into talking more about the law schools, that has an intersection there. You know, he, the person who knows the tools best has an advantage, even if they don't know legal practice the best. And, and so there's, there's a balance in there. But um, I, I, And I would step back from, from those to say, when we're trying to solve a problem, we're, we're generally looking at it from a, a broader perspective than one product. And, and so we're saying, right, right now we're saying, okay, we're not in the offices, we may not be for a long time, but certainly never will be back like we were. Therefore, how does technology provide the type of engagement that the office used to? Um, you used to walk in, whether you're a, a recruit, a client, a prospective client, or an employee, you used to walk into an impressive building and an impressive lobby and, and have service from a receptionist um, and be greeted by uh, people in person. And there's an experience to that, right? And law firms invest a lot in that experience. And that experience is gone. And so now you could say our technology and our data uh, has the burden of, of providing whatever experience that is. And so if you're experiencing Winston as a recruit or a lateral partner or a, or a client for the first time, and, and there's not a building involved, you know, what, what's your experience? Well, we want to provide that and keep people engaged. And, and so it's employee engagement, the client experience, um, lowering the cost of doing business. I mean, these are, these are the business problems that we're trying to solve. And, and I find a lot of times products are, are solving one piece of that. So implement me, I have no idea what's going on in the rest of that process but put in my product. And, and so the, unfortunately, when I look at that and say there's 30 parts to that process, so the client experience is 30 you know, big, big parts to it, and this product is one of them, you're not, you can't expect a lawyer or a client to learn 30 different products and, and, and keep switching. So that, sure. that's our perennial issue is when to solve business problems, when to impact clients, we're changing the business, but products are, are pretty narrow. And so it's our job to try to tie all that together in, in some way. Or yeah, I think you raise a great dichotomy. Priya, if I can just uh, ask, toss this to Jason for one second before-, before Absolutely, we I think that's the follow-on question. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so I, you know, I think David raised some, some, some fascinating issues about um, the concept of legal tech. Uh, um, my, my, my weirdo legal tech circle on, on Twitter talks about a lot about whether there even is something uh, that should be called legal tech and whether there's just technology. Um, Jason, from the point of view of, you know, depending on the day, the world's largest technology provider with, you know, a lot of amazing tools that can certainly handle probably the majority of what is trying to be tackled by legal tech. Do you have a view on where people should go to, you know, legal tech focused companies versus, um, you know, trying to understand what they already have in front of them as uh, our friend Casey Flaherty would, would always push? Uh, not surprisingly, uh, I, I think it's a really good idea to, to start with what you've already got. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so David and, and Gary actually, I think, answered much of what we're really getting at, which is, so first, start with the problem, right? So whenever you're starting off with, I have a piece of technology that I'm trying to shove into something, and it doesn't have a receptacle that is a righteous problem, <laughs> then you're you're, good, you're doing it wrong, right? Because what you're effectively trying to do is push something on somebody who's not feeling enough discomfort that they're willing to embrace it and say like, ah, yes, thank you for this gift. It's more like, oh, here's my, my Yorkshire Terrier that's not house trained, right? Like it's, so I, I think they, they really, that is really important when you start getting people thinking about how are you going to get organizations and people to embrace technology, it starts off with a very human centric focus. What are you trying to get done? And how can I help you do that? 
and not starting off with, I have something to, sh to like a new organ to put into your body. Start off with like, okay, let's diagnose the patient a little bit. Like what, what are they feeling? Yep. After you, you have a sense of like the problem to be solved that would create intrinsic value for the people who would be served. Then before you go to, you know, the, the drugstore and start buying stuff, what's on the shelf? So one of the things that I find so interesting is uh, I think many of, especially many commercial organizations are already swimming in technology. So again, going back to the things that David and Gary said, like they've, there's, li there's likely already a productivity stack that is in place. And before going and trying to layer something else on top of that, figure out what you already have that's there that you can do. I'll, I'll give you a uh, concrete example. So this summer, uh, by the way, so Microsoft brings in amazing interns, uh, one of whom who will be uh, showing up a little bit later. This summer, one of the things I did is I showed our interns how to take a combination of Excel, Word, and something called Power Automate, all which is part of the Microsoft 365 Enterprise SKU. And I showed them, here's how you automate creating cover letters. So if you want to go like, you know, cover the world in engagement and you don't want to do a bunch of find and replace or, you know, which by the way, you'll get it wrong. You'll miss something where you, you, something doesn't match up. Rather than do that, here are things that you likely already have access to that you can put into your workflow right now without buying anything else. And you can solve this problem for yourself. Yeah. Now, going back to, to Gary's point, that's not a legal tech solution, right? It's just a solution. Right, because it turns out that most legal, pro like legal workflow, is knowledge work, and so if you start looking into the parts bin for the things that help us do knowledge work really well, you already have much of what you need. But at some point, you're going to start getting into the the issues that that David raised, which is basically the cost of change. So a lot of what we struggle with is we go to people and we say, you know how you learned a whole bunch of stuff. I'd like you to throw all that away right now and learn something completely new. And they're just like, no, I don't want to do that because guess what? They're humans and humans are busy and they, their ability to absorb new stuff is, is really challenging. So I think where we are going to see a lot of promise is where we see people who understand both sides of the fence. Yep. They understand enough about the technology to say, this is the capability. And they know enough about the actual work, the jobs to be done to say, if we took this thing and we, we changed it just a little bit, it would be so much easier for the people who do the work to absorb so that the cost of change for them drops dramatically. And if you can do that, so if you can solve their problem and you can make it not like a truly onerous task to, to bring on that new capability, then you get way more engagement. And so a lot of what we think about goes back to what is the right, what is the, what's the righteous problem? And then from a human centered focus, how can we bring this solution to our internal customers in a way that they can embrace it using as much of the skill set they already have as possible? Maybe. At that point, yeah. And so now inev inevitably in that process, you will start identifying gaps in your capabilities. And it is when you, when you find the gap, that's when you start thinking about bringing something new into the stack. But starting off with the, there's a shiny object over there that I want to put on the Christmas tree. Ah, just, just pause and, and do some of that pre-work and then you will certainly find opportunities. But I, I'd say when you go in the other direction, you, you get yourself into trouble. Yeah, Thank you very much. You made such um, fantastic and valid points, all of you. And um, I, I love your um, use of the human centric, uh, you know, um, design thinking uh, terminology, something obviously very close to my heart. And therefore, I, I hate to use the word that uh, we help create um, technology solutions, because as you said, they're all just solutions. Sometimes they could involve technology. And I often use this um, analogy that it's, or, you know, it's like the cherry on top, if at all. Uh, most cakes don't need the cherry on top either. So thank you very much um, both of you, uh, for that. Um, and sort of slightly related, as you said, it's a, it's a knowledge problem that we are trying to solve majority of the time in, in legal. Um, and when we are, we are trying to use technology, the other very strong use of technology in, in our field is also to try and uh, increase collaboration between people, as you rightly said, you know, the, the human centric view, the, the you making sure that we are collaborating better as humans, as organizations. I wonder whether Jason, you would want to um, add something um, to, to that. So it, it's funny because when you look at so many of the business problems we have, they really do come down to communication and collaboration, right? And I, I, I observe that there are a couple of challenges uh, here. One is 
uh, the tools that we have are very powerful, but they often are not intuitive enough for folks. Um, like it requires a little bit too much understanding of like, how does this thing work? And so from a technology side, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to continue tuning those experiences so that again, the, the, the change management cost is much lower. And now I'm gonna throw some shade at the legal profession uh, as, as a general matter. If you think, if you look at how we are instructed uh, in law school, it is so much individual work. It's so much work on your own. Don't let anybody see what you're doing. Like, and so what happens is the, the real challenge that I perceive is people typically only want to provide access to their work at the very end when it's highly polished and it's unassailable and all these other things. And that's not how you get the best outputs. And so I do think that there are some technology issues that we can make better. But if I'm, if I'm really honest among us, a lot of what we have here is a bit of a culture problem. And I, this is where I think, go, please. Uh, no, I was just gonna add an and possibly mindset, as you rightly said, it's the mindset that you talk. It, it really is. Um, and, and I think that there's so much opportunity there to, to change how we do that. And so uh, maybe I'm, I don't wanna jump too far ahead, but I think if we rethink how the training process happens starting a little bit earlier, so in law schools, and we get people thinking group work first, collaboration work first, um, then I think maybe some of the other stuff gets a little bit easier. Uh, it also reaches back into some of the, uh, so I guess I will give a glimpse on what I regard as uh, kind of the past and the future. So if you look historically at legal work, a lot of the value was being a gatekeeper. So if you go back to what the Chief Justice was talking about, like a lot of these constructs were, were premised on the idea of like, exclusion, not inclusion. And we can debate as to the why, but it's not easy to get in the door and to even find the door. And once you get in the door, what do you do? And so one of the things that I find so interesting is I, I think there is an opportunity to just really rethink how we're going to actually do the work to make it much more approachable. So rather than even necessarily solving to make like the more arcane way that we do this better, what if we made everything a bit less arcane? What if we actually went upstream and said, rather than having this crazy language that we speak that doesn't, isn't spoken elsewhere, what if we put more of this into plain language so people could just access it? But here's why I think this is a really good thing. If you look at the future and where things are going, you will not be able to create value in the future as a gatekeeper because technology is going to make access to information plentiful. We're gonna be information rich, not information poor. So what you as an attorney or a legal professional is gonna be doing in the future is you're gonna be synthesizing things probably across domains. And so in that environment, you will create more value by having being able to surf a huge wave of more information and then putting the right things together. And so I think what we're seeing now is almost like a shift in, in the mindset and the thinking because in the old days, it's like you hoarded your work product because that was the thing that ultimately was your differentiated value. And looking forward, like the systems are like, we're gonna put everything in one place and everything's gonna be visible at some point. And so you really need to start shifting the way that you create value to being a synthesizer rather than somebody who's like, oh, I know where the magic one thing is over there that nobody else can find because there are gonna be machines that help us find that stuff. Thank you. Joe? Um, uh, I'm sorry, I was on mute right there. Um, so I, you know, I think uh, I, I think one of the themes that that actually a lot of the questions that have come in are about is 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 this concept of fear, um, the, the the fear of you know technology eliminating lawyers and um, and, and you know removing obviously work um, you know and I'll, I'll talk about this a little more as I hear the answers from the panel but but in in, in my view um, it's a false premise. Um, uh, when there's untapped demand in an industry, which I think we can all agree that there is, typically by lowering the cost, you increase the total pie. That's my thesis. That's not necessarily going to play out in the future, but it certainly has in a lot of other industries. I wanted to, uh, you know, I, I, wanted, I wanted to pull the audience a little, starting with Justice McCormick, um, if, if she's still with us, I hope, um, to, to talk about uh, this kind of fear versus greed uh, future we, we might be in. Um, yeah, it is, it's funny, it is, uh, I, this, this is a really fun conversation, by the way, I'm like, um, everything is resonating. I felt like saying amen a few times while you were speaking, Jason. Um, um, I, I also have uh, 
been uh, on the faculty at the University of Michigan Law School for 20 years. So I um, feel like I'm like in another part of the this the the one of the institutions that needs uh, some overhauling. Um, and I, you, 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 you do hear fear, not just, I think, um, probably from folks in the private sector who've been able to be um, trained and uh, be incredibly successful in this old model of, um, I'm the only one that knows the secret path to the gold star, um, but also from, I'm, I'm going to go back to my theme, um, from state court judges, um, you know, I, I, probably federal court judges as well. I just don't, I don't interact with them as much. And as you know, 95% of civil cases and 95% of criminal cases happen in state courts, not federal courts. So um, the great majority of um, judges are terrified, I find, um, as somebody who has been trying to encourage them um, to figure out what it is we can do, not to keep reminding me what we can't do. Um, but but the, 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 the fear is, is um, significant that you are going to be um, no longer needed, right? That you're gonna be, you know, sort of um, priced right out of the market because there's gonna be cheap ways to find your way to the gold star um, that don't involve you. And I, I find that to be um, just not compelling at all. I, you know, I, obviously, in all kinds of other ways, um, technology, I think, I hope, makes me more effective, maybe more efficient, um, maybe, you know, helps me save a lot of time on the stuff that um, doesn't feel like the best use of my, uh, the, the things that I think I do add, the, my, you know, my value add is not, you know, slogging through um, the stuff that a machine can slog through. It's actually then making sense of um, how to how to use that information um, um, with with the human judgment that that that's only going to be more um, valuable when I can build in those efficiencies. But teaching that to law students is really important, um, and law faculties like judges. Uh, all got to where we were um, in this old system. So this cultural shift that we're going to need to see is a really big one um, because you don't get to be a tenured member of a law school faculty, especially a top um, 20 law school faculty um, or a law school dean um, on this model, right? You got there on the old model. Um, so the, the, the judges who are running our courts, the um, deans who are running our law schools, um, have to be ready to lead in this cultural shift. Um, and I wish I could convince them that there's nothing to be afraid of. You're still really, really smart and your judgment is gonna be very useful, just more efficient. Um, but I don't know, yeah, I'll work I, on it. I think that's fascinating. I, you know, it's something I, I, I've definitely struggled with a lot. Um, Gary, I'd love to turn this to you uh, as someone who's, who's you know, built and sold uh, large-scale legal technology. W what's your view on, on on how this technological kind of revolution will, will impact the job market and, and the net demand for legal services? Gary? Did we lose Gary? I think we lost Gary. Yeah, I think he's frozen. He's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> as we discussed the, the value of technology. Um, uh, Priya, should we move on? Uh, yes, actually, we, since we were already uh, talking and, and I think um, Jason oh. and, oh, you back. Gary, would you Stop. want to offer yeah. that? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so, Joe, this, this is a unique fear of our technology just automating people away. Like my, my, my banker friends or my doctor friends don't really worry about software like taking out their jobs, right? Uh, so this is really unique. Uh, I feel like somewhat unique for lawyers. Uh, first off, you know, what I tell folks is you're never worse off by being more efficient, right? You're never ever worse off from that, right? Secondly, there are lots of tasks that don't get done or don't get done very well that people can now focus on if tech makes them more productive, right? I think that lawyers fundamentally undersell themselves. I think they add a tremendous amount of value and they do a lot of work that productivity software can help out and which frankly they shouldn't be doing that they should focus on higher value, higher value ad work. Uh, everybody agrees there's an access to justice problem, right? So that means that there is, you know, excess demand for legal services that's not being met. Um, we also all know that there are way too many lawyers out there that don't have enough work. So 
the supply and demand curves for legal don't intersect right now, right? So clearly there's a need there for tech to kind of bridge the gap, right? So again, lawyers do a lot of high value add work. Uh, they, should, they should be doing more of it. Um, and there's a lot to be done that I think tech can help out on. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the question a different way. There there is a a phrase um, uh, that kind of goes around the startup circles in almost every other industry, which is if you want to make a billion dollars, figure out how to help a billion people, right? I, I think in law we all point out the problems, and there are so many of them that you know millions, if not billions, of people all over the world suffer a justice gap. But the other side of that 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 problem presents both you know moral and economic opportunity why do you think that 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 that, that doesn't necessarily resonate in law that 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 you know this this opportunity for change is i think once in a generation maybe maybe once in history um both economic and moral opportunity well the the minor reason is trying to figure out a business model right but that's people you know so you know people have figured that out in other on the circles, furniture right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. People, have, people, people have figured that out, right? Uh, the second issue is there's this, uh, this self-consciousness, this lack of self-confidence that the profession has for some reason, where like for some reason we think that, you know, we don't offer that much value add or something that if tech comes, we're not as useful. It's just not true, right? Uh, there's so much injustice out there you know there's there's still going to be disputes there's still someone that needs to advise on risk uh, it's a cultural thing i think in some sense yeah i know yeah i i think it resonates for for me and for a lot of people when you talk about the senior partner who's been doing their work for for decades um it doesn't necessarily resonate for me with you know, more junior people who I, you know, I, I look through their eyes and I see this world of possibility, this mm -hmm. ability to impact the future in a way that could, that could never happen before. Um, right. Anyone else have any view on that? Jason, David? I, I just make a distinction. We, it, it will come for some people's jobs, those that won't change. And, and so we were mentioning that earlier. So if you, uh, if you are not going to change and you're not close enough to retirement age, um, it is coming for your job, perhaps. And so, you know, the assumption I think we all have in, in saying that there is plenty here is that there is plenty as long as you are willing to be adaptive to use these new tools and, um, and actually improve your efficiency, effectiveness, your value, and all those. So I think it's an underlying assumption we're all stating that you have to, um, you have to change. Yeah. I, I agree. I just want to point out, and at least in my view, it's not just money. It's, you know, it, whatever you want to do, if you want to make, you know, you know, an impact through government, I think technology simply allows ideas to be scaled. That's, that's it. That, um, mm -hmm. Priya, uh, can I hand it to you? Yes, I was just wondering, and in fact, some of you have already sort of started to touch upon that. So I wonder whether um, I could ask a little bit more in terms of all of this discussion that we've been having today, in particular in terms of the changes in the legal tech and how, as David said, it's about how quickly you adapt to those changes and how you work with them. I wonder whether I could, starting from you, Justice McCormick, while we still have you, um, share your views on what, how should the law schools um, be um, you know, thinking about these changes? What changes, for example, to their curricula should they be thinking? Or law students who might be taking um, their, their exams and their, their studies right now should be thinking about their careers in the future? Um, yeah, it's a great question and I actually think about it a lot. Um, I think that there are a whole set of skills that law schools um, are going to need to be teaching that um, they aren't yet, or, or some are, or some teach them in specific, you know, legal tech programs, but they're going to have to become fundamental um, um, skills that law students need, need to learn. But I think Jason said something really important about the way law school has to change that I couldn't agree with more that, that we, you know, I went to law school in, I don't remember, but I graduated in 1991, so I must have gone in 1988. But, um, I, you know, it was the model of, we still had to, like, go hunt through the library for, you know, in the first week of law school to find the answer to the one question in legal research or whatever it was. And it was like a competitive, like people ripped pages out of books and like very individualized, com I'm just not kidding, competitive. I went to NYU, by the way, just so everybody knows, not Michigan. Um, but, um, but competitive, like individualized um, learning that, that isn't 
uh, effective for um, figuring out big solutions to big problems. Complex systems need problems to be surrounded by stakeholders. That's just that we have to surround problems. Um, and so we have to fundamentally change the way we learn and teach in law schools, not just what we teach in law schools. Um, so I, the University of Michigan Law School has this, again, it's just an add-on, it's, it's just one, like it's the, the current dean has a great idea, which is this problem-solving initiative where he pairs a law school professor with somebody from another discipline. So I taught a class on access to justice last fall, last spring with um, a, a technologist. Um, and we took students from across the university. So there were four law students or maybe five, I don't remember. But then there were education students and social work students and computer science students and engineers and um, a business student. And they worked in teams on access to justice problems. And the learning was tremendous. And the ideas that came out of it were tremendous for the law students. I hope for the others as well, but the law students are my main audience. So I was like fascinated to watch them you know, uh, see a, um, a, a, an education student and a social work student say, well, why would we think about it that way? Doesn't it, wouldn't it, you know, even, wouldn't it make more sense if when we walked into, the, when we walked into the courthouse, there was a video that told us where to do this, or there was just a person who, told, you know, there's sort of the, 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 the ways in which the non-law students shook the law students about um, how they were thinking about solving complex problems was tremendous. Again, it was an add-on. It's not the way we do law school, but it maybe needs to be. Thank you. And I, I cannot, um, you know, that resonates a lot with me, the multidisciplinary aspect that you're asked talking about. Uh, and my favorite is also to bring in little children sometimes into these design sprints. The, the perspective that they bring in, the questions they can ask really throws us off and, and gives us in a, in a very new direction. So thank you for that. Um, David, if I could ask you to share your views, Jason, I know you've already shared yours briefly, but David, if I could ask you to share yours. Of course, the, in addition to what they, they raised, the, the, the term new law has been used a lot more recently. And, and often people are, I, I think, incorrectly saying new law equals alternative legal service providers. But I, I would argue that the two related aspects, but new law is, is an improved way to practice the law. And, and alternative legal service providers, which is a term we should stop using, law firms um, and e-discovery specialists, et cetera, they all have different um, capabilities in, in these areas. Uh, as you know, I'll, I'll throw the big four in as well. And so, um, but, you know, we're talking about aspects of project management, of understanding processes and process improvement, making uh, data-driven decisions, uh, helping with programming and doing data analytics and doing uh, challenges and how to solve problems faster. These, these, are, these are the cool things that new law is all about. And, and I, I think you'd all agree that law school students are not taught these things at all, much less, I mean, we've classically said they're not taught business school things, that, that is true. And they're also not taught these skills and assets that we apply to what we consider the future, the, whatever new law is, um, they're not taught those skills either. Maybe that's too much to expect. You're learning the legal profession and you're learning how to apply it, but that seems like a great way to come out of school is, is ready to apply what you've learned in these environments. Um, and you're, I mean, can you get that from your company? I think that's a great challenge for, for the students uh, as they're doing, you know, whether it's their summer program or what, is to say, hey, there's all these skills beyond the law, how, how well can you help me grow those skills? And how well do you really reflect those skills? How well do your, your partners or your leaders actually represent those skills? In other words, if I'm managing a project using data-driven, am I, am I a fish out of water? Um, I think that, that would really be a great compliment, whether the law school teaches it or some other way to infuse it during their period there, you know, that, that's to be seen, but those, that skill set would be a big change. Thank you. And as um, as Justice McCormick um, just mentioned in the sense of it's not the what, but it's the why we teach. So as long as whether it's legal skills or, as you've rightly said, the other complementary skills, we are, you know, as long as we are trying to sort of adapt the way we teach uh, our law students, that would make a lot of difference. Um, Justice McCormick, did you want to add something? Or are you? No, I was just going to let you know that unfortunately I have to go to my next meeting, which happens to be the ABA Council on Legal Education and Admission to the Bar. So I'll take these great ideas with me. Brilliant. Thanks for including me in this conversation. And I'm sorry not to stick around. I feel like I'm learning a ton. I'll, I'll watch it later. <laughs>
No, it was, well, it was fantastic. Very, yeah. very much again for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Um, from one of my special or, or, or sort of favorite topics to another one, I wonder if I could um, now move on to diversity and inclusion in, in the legal profession and the culture. And we've again been touching upon this slightly, but in a different way that how um, you know, the, the, the sort of changes are reimagining legal technology also involves sort of reimagining the culture of the profession. Um, and a lot of uh, sort of particularly in when we look at sort of private sector, um, the culture is is both for whether it's for accessing career development or you know client cultivation, all of that is majority, you know, again, individual based and very much around relationships and networks. Um, and I wonder to what extent the pandemic has changed this and, uh, you know, how can technology in particular help us create a more inclusive culture uh, in the legal profession going forward? If I could start with you, David. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge topic. We could spend the 90 minutes just on, on this area, of course, but uh, I'll give two examples. Um, one within uh, Winston, where we, we have always had a what we call a free market system, meaning that our associates, it, it's their responsibility to have relationships with the partners that they can uh, and proactively to go um, out and understand the work that is coming and to make their expertise known and and to um, get work by, um, by, by, you know, being part of that market and, and market themselves in that way. And so, um, and, and what we've seen is that we need to do more, that we, we needed to complement that process with a, with more of a, um, a controlled resource management process that, that said, yeah, you, you should definitely make yourself known. You should network. Um, but in addition to take a data driven approach, because we found that, it wasn't really serving um, our minorities either by gender or by race. Um, and, and in fact, outside of adversity, it wasn't serving some personalities very well. You know, if you're a great engineer, but you're not a great networker, uh, maybe it doesn't serve you well. So complementing the, the human side with the data side so that we can proactively make sure that we um, uh, force a process that says we, we, we are, it, it's kind of like saying, you're not agnostic to race. You're actually actively dealing with the issue. That's where we've had to go. We, we need to actively deal with the allocation of associates in order to make sure that it is fair and more fair and better. Um, and then the other is I've been working with a group of about a hundred uh, legal departments and law firms around this initiative uh, we call legal metrics. And, and it's really about, helping the law firms to understand the metrics that the legal department already sees them by. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we, our group chose to focus on diversity first because it was um, unfortunately the most opaque, um, but among the most important. And, and so you already had the legal departments uh, looking at this information, but very difficult for the law firms to see themselves in that light. And, and, and certainly if, if you look at a, a dashboard of a law firm, it's going to have dollar signs in there. It's not going to have diversity information. And you, know, you obviously have to be careful about sharing information anyways. And so that group, I've been very um, thrilled to work. I, I consider working for them in that way because they're helping to design the solution, which really helps to make that um, shareable metrics that the law firms and the legal departments can, can both analyze. And, and we, you know, we haven't, collected enough data to say, here are the results of that. We'll know that over time, but at least be able to make the metrics um, more clear. I mean, right, right now, they're generally metrics on the 29th page of, of an RFP, and <laughs> one, one person in the firm has to deal with that issue, and once a year, they report. And that's, that's just, it's like the, the page being buried in the library. You know? We're trying to say, no, no, bring that up to a dashboard. So if you're looking at the status of a client, you can see, yeah, your budget is trending right, but your diversity is trending wrong, or you're not going to be in compliance in six months based on your trend. Uh, I mean, diversity is just one metric, but that, that's such a huge immaturity we have in professional services. Even though we care about it so much, it's not treated like we do. And, and so we wanted to change that, and, and it's coming along very well. Thank you. That's very helpful. And uh, it, there's a trend here in the UK for sure um, in terms of, and I'm sure it's probably the same in the UK as well, the US as well, in the sense of the firms coming up and, and sharing their diversities, um, sort of statistics and pay gaps and, you know, the, the sort of proportion of partners and so on and so forth. And it's a 
it's a nice um, sort of thing to do. So thank you for sharing the data-driven approach. It's really, really important to, to use technology for that. Um, Jason, I wonder if you would like to add um, your um, take on that. Sure, a couple of observations. So first, I, I really do want to shout out Winston. Uh, they really do walk the talk. And we, are, we have specific engagements going on with them that I think are a little bit spicy that I, I love seeing. And uh, so one of the things that you know, most firms do is they will show up with a, well, well, just tell me what you want. And one of the things that differentiated Winston's approach was, we have an idea. Are you interested in trying this? And it sounds like a very small, like, oh, it, that is a rare thing because most firms, they, for whatever reason, and we don't have to get into it, they, they will only be reactive. And so I've been very impressed by Winston's approach because they're proactive. And here's the other thing I'll let other folks know. I think that's helping them get more business. So, hey. Um, so our general counsel uh, cares a lot about diversity. And so we are investing quite a bit to up our game uh, and turn that into something that we programmatically and systematically drive. But I think it's really important to take a, a quick step back and ask why does she care about that, right? So yes, there are some very real, like it's, it's, it feels good, it's the right thing to do for society, like that is all true. But the other thing that she perceives is that Diverse teams bring us better value. They get us better outcomes. They help serve our business because it goes back to what the Chief Justice was talking about. The different perspectives that they bring make them more generative and creative in the solutions. And that is ultimately you know, the thing that they bring that creates more value for us as a customer and a client. So then it turns into that, how do we do this? And so one of the things that we uh, have been specifically doing is putting more investment in finding ways to get the information about who is actually doing our work and then trying to shape our engagement behaviors to drive the outcomes that we want. The other thing that, uh, that we do is we create incentives for the firms who do uh, our, a lot of our work to bring more diverse teams. So there actually are cash incentives <laughs> Uh, for our, our panel firms, when they bring uh, diverse folks to not just do the work, but also into the leadership layer. So leading the matters, you know, leading the relationship and also leading the firms. And so, you know, our GC puts a lot of thought into how she, and it goes back to one of the words that we, we heard at the beginning, how, are she, how is she designing systems? Mm -hmm. Systems that cause the deliberate and intentional outcomes that we think are well aligned with both our business and our culture. And now I'll speak to what this means to me on more of a personal level. So, you know, I, I need to be thoughtful about what does the portfolio look like of people that, you know, I'm, I'm mentoring, that I'm sponsoring, that, that I'm supporting. And that means making sure that, you know, look, I, I always pick the best, but it means I need to look more broadly. And I need to make sure that the portfolio of, of, of people that I'm supporting is representative of the culture that we have in the world. And that takes a little bit more effort, but it also means that you get access to, to just gems, right? So one specific example for me recently is I started talking with uh, the, the CEO of a company called clearbrief.ai, and she mm -hmm. is awesome. And, you know, she got onto my radar in kind of a, a slightly like less conventional way, but I was like, you know what, let me go take a look. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. And I think that's incumbent upon us all to start really being thoughtful about what is the portfolio of people that I'm supporting and making sure that that's representative because it's a fractal problem, right? The things that David is talking about, like they operate, you know, at the societal level, they operate at the organizational level, but it also requires each of us to be introspective and say like, what does that mean for me as an individual? What am I going to do differently to make the world differently, make the world look as I want it to? And then how can I influence others to do the same? Thank you very much. That's very, very interesting and fascinating take. And particularly, I love the way that you emphasize on the why we need to encourage diversity and inclusion in the profession. And it is to drive value because diverse teams deliver better value for everybody involved. Um, and I love the way you put it in terms of societal organization and personal uh, you know, level commitment as well. So thank you for sharing those. Um, I wonder whether I have time for just one last question, Jim. Is that all right? Um, 
I wanted to touch base on it because you again mentioned uh, one of the uh, sort of founders of uh, legal tech, and so I wonder whether I could. Um, this is an open one because women in legal tech. One could say that, particularly on the sort of um, you know buyer side, there is uh, we, we're probably well represented in the sense that a lot of decision makers and users of legal technology, and particularly change makers, tend to be. Thanks, Jen. She's saying to finally go for it. Um, I think we are. I see a lot of women, particularly from my network, or you know, she breaks the noise is a great example. We are two thousand plus women from fifty countries. Clearly, we are dedicated. We are well represented, or at least better represented. But when we look at um, the, the sort of entrepreneurial side, or you know, in particular, when we look at founders of, let's say, legal tech companies, the trend is very much similar to you know, any tech startups, which is that the percentages dwindle down and we, you know, women are really, really poorly represented in, in that sector. And I wonder if I could invite, um, uh, you know, starting from you, Gary, maybe some observation in terms of what you think are the factors and how could we encourage and redress the situation so that more women uh, led initiatives receive funding and you know uh, have more opportunities to to uh, um, to increase women funding uh, sorry women led uh, legal technology companies sure um, I think it, it goes without saying the current status kind of stinks right uh, depending on how you look at the data uh, Anyway, whether it's v aggregate VC dollars or number of startups, whether it's just you know, female only teams or just mixed gender teams, something around only two to 20% of uh, startups are you know, led by female founders, right? Which is clearly ridiculous, right? Um, so given that low base, uh, that's the bad news. Uh, the, the, the good news is that it's getting better, right? It is getting better. Not quickly enough, but it is getting better, right? Um, so in terms of how to do it, how to increase that rate of, you know, more female founders getting venture dollars, establishing successful startups, I think it's a combination of things. One, venues like this and having these conversations, right, and just making it an issue, I think is very important. Uh, number two, I think, you know, just from a macro level, you know, having mentors available that can you know, advise people, give good advice in terms of how to execute properly. Um, and then again, you know, it's, you know, it's obviously a bit weird for a, I me mean, as, as a male talking about this, but I think just from a tactical standpoint, I think, you know, just having meetups and communities where women can also just talk about how they, you know, in particular face issues and how they tackled those issues is also helpful. And that's sort of the, the goes to the core of uh, our She Breaks the Law Foundation, but but that, thank you for that. Um, would anybody else want to share their views? And this is open for all. David? Yeah, I'll, I'll add a point which kind of goes to what Gary and, and Jason said, because the, the, in legal, the, the legal department drives the pace of change, um, and at least in the market you know, for the last decade. And, and so there's a lot of emphasis on the legal department understanding the, in this case the gender diversity of of the lawyers and so that's basically we're a supplier to them they're they're analyzing their supplier to make sure there's diverse but there is there's no pressure on on the law firm to do the same and so we are we have no pressure to or very little pressure to understand the diversity of our suppliers mm -hmm. and, and so if, if the company gary is speaking about is a startup or is uh, you know, when Jason mentioned, for example, um, those are our suppliers. We're, we're using a lot, and and my budget is 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 pretty big, and and so you know we spend a lot of money on on these things, and so that's one way that we could affect some change is if there is more pressure for us to analyze our suppliers on on whatever you know on all the different uh, diversity uh, aspects, um, and and then you know there's also the uh, you know the the traditional aspects of of um, sometimes the the training that they uh, receive. Um, you know, female lawyers may sign up for different classes or such, and so sometimes it's a less of being forced to do it, but really having the motivation or or the the acceptance of the audacity to do a startup, and and maybe there's some counseling or coaching or support. Um, that firms can do. I, I know our firm and our, our head of diversity is, you know, has a lot of programs to make sure that we're encouraging everybody to um, feel confident in themselves and find solutions. And, and sometimes we encourage them to start their own business. Um, in that sense. And so I, I think 
the firms, the legal departments, um, taking in interns, there's lots of programs, we can probably do a lot more than we are to, to help them. And I think it goes a lot deeper than that as well. It's a lot to do with the systems. It's a lot to do with unconscious and conscious biases. And it's a lot to do with, I mean, hard data just doesn't lie. I mean, you, as, as, yeah. as you've said, and you know, the percentage of women finally, women-led initiatives getting uh, funding is, is abysmal. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, there's been so much research and, and data there to, if you just change the name, the same application gets, for example, viewed by the VC and you get an interview, you know, the, the extent to which there are these biases, I think they're, um, I mean, as much as I'd love to, to talk about this, and I'm sure we could dedicate a whole session to this, I'm conscious of the time. So unless there are any final comments, I reckon I need to hand back to, to Joe. <laughs> any, any last comments from the panel? Um, if not, Priya, I wanted to thank you so much for, for hosting this with me. Jason, Gary, David, these were these were really phenomenal points. Um, to the audience out there, especially the students, um, uh, you know, from the Future of the Profession uh, initiative, uh, think of ways to put wheels on that luggage, you know, combine things that, that are already out there. And uh, I think with that, we're going to pass it to Sonari um, to, to, to close out today's session. J Jen, did I miss anything? Sonari. No, that's everything. Thank you. And, and thank you, Sonari Chidi, for, for leading us into the Q&A section. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Jen. Um, thank you so much to our expert panelists and to everyone for being here. Uh, I hope that you've been submitting your questions uh, through the Q&A um, panel. I just want to share that the second out of three CLE passcodes is Lily. Again, the second out of three CLE passcodes is Lily. Um, so we've been monitoring the Q&A window and, um, you know, it's been great to hear the, the discussion. Our audience has a, a number of uh, wonderful questions. So I'll start out with a question from William Weber, um, who asks, do you see a role for solo practitioners selling legal services to individuals in the future, such as routine personal injury, trust in estates, small business contracts and others, or will legal technology lead to a rapid consolidation of the market? And this goes out to anyone who'd like to answer. Gary, what do you think? Uh, yeah, there'll always be room for solo practitioners, right? Uh, just remember, like, okay, think about the opposite scenario, a consolidation, right? Why would you have consolidation? So think about Amazon, right? Amazon can get market share because their backend infrastructure, their warehouses, their delivery has economies of scale. There's no evidence that there's that in legal. Right, so there'd only be consolidation if you could provide evidence that consolidation allows for economies of scale. Um, and even if there theoretically was, there's again, huge access to justice problem, huge need for lawyers, huge excess demand for lawyers. So yeah, totally will be a need for solos. And, and even with an Amazon example, it still allows individuals to uh, leverage that. So does it, even that doesn't exclude individuals from uh, working with each other, so absolutely. Thank you so much, Gary and David. Um, our next question is from uh, Jason. Did you or anyone else have anything to add to that? Okay, great. Um, our next question is from Dean Ted Ruger of Penn Law. Um, he has a question about, uh, you know, what Justice Mc, Chief Justice McCormick said earlier, and I'll just read the question. Um, listening to the Chief Justice talk about how courts and courtrooms don't face ordinary market pressures to innovate, I'm reminded of some conversations I had earlier this summer with some of our alumni around the world who are leading attorneys in the world of international arbitration and dispute resolution. There's already competition and innovation in that realm, and it's been accelerated by COVID. I wonder if domestic courts, like those in Michigan or elsewhere, are facing or will one day face a form of such competition from litigants choosing to take their disputes to a private forum. Um, I'll open this up to the, the entire panel, whoever would like to jump in. I, I guess I have an observation, which is, there very much is a market that happens for different types of uh, conflict and dispute. There's uh, a state in the United States called Texas that has uh, enjoyed a lot of a certain type of litigation uh, over the last decade or so. And so we should absolutely expect that, you know, savvy 
uh, players will seek to use the venues that provide the most efficient way and the mo really the most efficient infrastructure to make the business outcomes happen that they care about. And I think it goes back to what the Chief Justice was talking about earlier, which is law is infrastructure for society. Like a civil society needs a well-functioning legal substrate to, to have our, all, it helps moderate all of our interactions and our relationships. It is critical. And so it is, I think, a competitive advantage that the United States uh, has enjoyed in the past that we've, we've had, I think, a, a very well-running, uh, you know, substrate that supports so much of society. And to think that we should enjoy that advantage without continued investment seems a little bit silly. And so when I look at what other countries are doing, and I, I will not name any, but uh, there's some that are doing like really interesting progressive things where they're making investments that, you know, we will not see the benefits for, that, for them systemically, you know, a year from now or probably even three years from now. But when we start looking out a decade and we start seeing that when people understand that if you, if you do business or other types of things that happen really efficiently there, that will start attracting uh, more economic activity and ultimately that'll benefit those countries. So I, I hope that we as a society and in this country are really thoughtful about the investments that we need to make to, to continue to support the society and the business that supports that society. Certainly, definitely. Does anyone um, have anything else to add on that point? Not quite the same point, but the you know, so much litigation now is is intersected with uh, financing um, and insurance that the the market is is changing. And so when you have you know in the financial markets, when you have such capital infusions coming in, then they start to roll the different products together. Um, I, I don't know how it affects the courts. I can't really speak to that. But but you would expect by looking at other industries that there's so much um, capital available now to, um, to support litigation or to finance, you know, by financing it or, or to buy it in, in that sense, that there will be some commoditization of how to price that, how to, um, how to make sure that they get the return on that investment. And so I, I, I say that more from a reflection of the financial markets than the court system but it seems like it's, it's inevitable for our, our future in some ways. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, is from Nakul Goenka and um, speaks to a topic that has been in the news and on, I'm sure, a number of our, our minds. Um, he asks, uh, or they ask, what role does cybersecurity play in legal tech? And I'll open well, this up to anyone. As a CIO, I guess I'll, I'll take that one. Um, it, it's job one. I mean, it is, uh, it, it is not, I guess maybe part of your question is what's legal about legal tech in, in that area? And I would say not much. I, I can't think of anything that we do. We're very serious about cybersecurity, of course, and I can't think of anything we do that is specific to the legal market. All our vendors and products and processes and certifications are all the same as any real company uh, should do if you're bigger or smaller or, or different. Um, and so from a, a legal, if I just look at the legal tech part of that question, um, I mean, there are, are some AI tools um, that are looking at, um, you know, the conversations between people and trying to understand the risk elements of that. And so there are, um, there are some ways that, again, I wouldn't consider that quite specific to legal because uh, you know, email traffic in general is team oriented. And, uh, and so I'd say very, um, very little, if anything, that we do is specific to the market, um, even though we take it so, so seriously. That's, uh, that's my answer for you. I have, I have two observations that I, some of which build on what David is, is saying. One, like, if we're honest, the biggest cybersecurity risk is usually untrained people who use your stuff in your organization. <laughs> and you can, you can try to buy your way out of that with like tools. And I will say some of them really help because they will put guardrails on things. But 
a lot of your uh, security posture is strengthened by just having savvier people in your organization who understand like what a spear phishing attack is and how to, which again, it's not, so a lot of the like problems that happen, they, they happen at much more pedestrian places, not because there's like, you bought some legal tech thing and oh my God, goodness, it created an exploit. It's, it's a lot of people just doing stuff and they don't really understand what's going on. So that's one. The, the other, as I think I build on what David is saying and like abstract a little bit and say, cybersecurity is relevant for everyone. It is not sectarian. It's not like relevant for legal tech. It, it is relevant for everyone because so many uh, businesses that are medium to large enterprises are basically becoming in some way software businesses, right? They're supercharging what they do, whatever their underlying value creation engine is, they're finding ways to apply technology to make it faster, to make it better, to make it cheaper, to make it smarter. And so if you're doing that, then you're starting to create these assets, which didn't exist before, which are information. And that starts to become something that is attractive because if it's valuable for you, then either depriving you of it or giving it to someone else is a way for a criminal to create value. And so I would say that people who are in law school now should probably be opening their aperture a little bit and understanding that information is this new asset class that we have historically not been as focused on, but it is very quickly becoming coin of the realm. And then I would just add for all the budding legal tech entrepreneurs out there, um, security is now just something baseline that you and your startup need to be good at if you want to sell to legal departments or large law firms. Uh, you know, I remember when I started 13, 14 years ago, you could, people could still buy products with their credit card, download it onto their work machine and they could use it, right? Uh, yeah, not happening now. So you now have to build that into your business model. Um, there's ways around it, there's ways to minimize the costs, but that is now something that if you're going to work with legal department or law firm data or information, you now need to get good on uh, security and heavy house owner. Lovely. David, did you? Just uh, disagree. That's, uh, that, that is, n nothing comes before our spend on security and, you know, people process and technology and no, you know, we talk a lot about governance, every system that comes in. I mean, Microsoft Teams obviously is seeing a huge surge in, in firms right now. And so um, the challenge is how do we govern that? How do we make sure we don't lose control of that? We have such a, a you know, careful matter categorization. So how do we apply that? So people are, you know, firms recognize that you can't just throw a system out there and, and then uh, expect it to um, expect to be able to control it afterwards. So it's, it's a big, the gov it's, you know, security and governance side by side. Definitely. And going back to Jason's point about, you know, um, the, the highest security risks being the untrained, <laughs> the untrained individuals in your, in your area that are accessing the information and technology, you know, I think goes back to the, the spirit of this, which is the future of the profession and, um, you know, getting law students new lawyers and experienced practitioners uh, uh, engaged with legal tech as, as we talked about earlier um, from the from the ground floor up. Um, and so thank you so much for for the uh, questions that the audience brought in and thank you to our expert panelists for your answers. I'll hand it over to Jen now. Thank you so much, Sonari. Great questions. Uh, thanks to the audience for your engagement. This was such a fantastic conversation. I feel like uh, channeling Justice McCormick saying there were so many times I just wanted to scream amen to so many things that you all were talking about. And uh, one of the great things is that where we are in our law school, our new initiative allows us to continue building on these conversations, bringing together people from all across different parts of the profession to spark new ideas and, and to generate change. So I just wanna thank Joe and Priya for your expert facilitation of this great conversation. I wanna thank our experts, David, Gary, Jason, and Justice McCormick for contributing all of your great ideas. I hope we'll continue to talk. Um, I also want to thank uh, the people behind the scenes that made this possible, particularly Naoshi Giles from our conferences and events team who kept everybody on script and on target uh, to deliver this content to you, as well as Dalila Lewis, Ben Horning from our ITS department, um, and our colleague Susan Raritan Lambreth, uh, who's not on the webinar today, but was our partner in designing this Reimagining the Future of the Profession Initiative series. 
which we will resume later this fall and focus on reimagining the future of courts, reimagining the future of consumer legal services, and reimagining the future of lawyer formation. So some of the things we started talking about today, we can delve into more deeply, and I hope you'll all join us then. Um, and with that, I have one final piece of housekeeping for those of you seeking CLE. Uh, the last CLE passcode is JAGUAR. That's JAGUAR, J-A-G-U-A-R. If you're seeking CLE credit for today's event, please remember to fill out your digital evaluation form and include the CLE codes announced throughout the event. The evaluation, the evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credit. The link to the digital evaluation form was emailed to you, but the link to the form can also be found in the chat. So please complete that survey. Thank you to everybody for this afternoon's conversation. I hope you all stay well, stay safe, and we'll look forward to other conversations like these in the future.